Thank you so much, Johnny, for reading that. And thank you, worship team. And good morning, everyone. Today we are in Joshua chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the sixth book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, sixth book of the Bible. Now on Tuesday, not this Tuesday, on Tuesday, April 18th, 1775, a Boston silversmith named Paul Revere rode on horseback to warn American colonists about an incoming attack and an impending invasion of British forces into the city of Lexington. That happened on Tuesday, 18, 1775. And the quote that has immortalized this man throughout history is this, the British are coming. Something that we all remember, we've all heard, the British are coming. And Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 24, is a very similar account that took place three, over 3,000 years prior to this moment, uh, but with one major difference. You see, in Joshua, we're talking about how Israel is coming into the land. They are the invading force. But what the Canaanites, specifically Jericho, as we're talking about, they don't fear Israel. Israel is just a group of slaves that came from Egypt. Like They don't have the military strength. They don't have the might. They spent, sent out spies 40 years before this moment and came back with an evil report but said, there are giants in the land. We, we cannot face up to them. They have fortified cities like Jericho. There's a wall all the way around. They have a great, powerful military. There's nothing that we can do to accomplish this task that the Lord is leading us to do. And again, that's kind of the point of the Christian life. God leads us into impossible situations, so we have to trust him. But what's going on here in the book of Joshua is that the Canaanites knew about Israel. They knew all through here. They knew exactly why the men were there. They, they knew what Israel was doing. They knew they were spying out the land. They knew where Israel had come from, from Egypt. They knew all about Israel. And if it were a war between two enemies, the Canaanites and the Israelites, Jericho would rule the day, no questions asked. But the cry and the fear of these pagan people was not that Israel was coming. No, what they feared more than anything else was this one truth, Yahweh was coming. Joshua chapter 2 verse 8, before the men lay down, Rahab came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know, this is what I know, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Why? Because we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord your God. This is the truth right here. The Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. They feared this one thing. Yahweh was coming. And so this was not merely a battle between Israelites and Canaanites. This was a war between the true God and the false gods. If you go into the book of Exodus and you see all, the, all of those plagues that God brought on the Egyptians, the ten plagues... Each one of them, if you actually study it out, was a direct assault from Yahweh against certain Egyptian gods. He, was not just, he didn't just come up with this random series of events. Oh, I think I'll just make a lot of frogs appear, or I'll just make a lot of flies, or I'll just make darkness. Like He was going after their belief system. He was challenging everything that they had held to as a nation. And so this was a war between the true God and the false gods. This was a war between the holy God and the rampant sin of this society, this culture, the Canaanite civilization. And this was a war between the righteous God and the wicked inhabitants. And so more than anything else, this was God's battle and Yahweh was coming. And that is why the people were afraid. Because who can stand up against this God? The answer is no one. They had never before in all of human history seen someone literally part basically an ocean Walls hundreds of feet high so that all of one nation, two million people maybe, could pass through and then collapse it on the entire Egyptian army. And that's one of the things you have to take note of. As we read through the book of Joshua, you never see Egypt. You never see Egypt in Judges or in Ruth or even later on. You don't actually see Egypt reappear until the time of the kings, hundreds of years later. Why is that? It's like they just kind of disappeared off the face of the map. It's because God collapsed the nation. 
God came in, destroyed their military, and the Egyptian superpower, who had flooded the land of Canaan at this point, they had to withdraw all of their forces, and they had to go back to Egypt, and they had to recover, and it took century after century and after century for them to do so. And so all of this news, this was common knowledge in this day. They did not fear the Israelites coming, they, they feared Yahweh was coming. And so this is what we see in Joshua chapter 2, is the fact that no one rivals our God. He has no competition, he has no equal, there is no one who stands up against him, no one who stands in his faith, not even death can conquer our God. And so Yahweh is coming, that is the title of this message. And what we see in, Gen- in Joshua chapter 2 is Yahweh is coming and he will act in three ways regarding his people. He will act in three ways on behalf of his people. He will guide his people in the right direction. He will guard his people from the coming wrath. And he will give his people everything that he's promised. Why? Because he is faithful as always. This is the God that we serve. He is faithful as always. This is our God. And he is coming. But I want you to notice this key phrase here, his people. Because this is what we're going to focus on throughout the book of Joshua. This is what God is doing for his people people specifically. He doesn't do this for other people. He doesn't guide other people. He doesn't guard other people. He doesn't give to his people. I mean, it's like how a father leads his family or a pastor leads his church. Government leads their nation. God leads his people. And so if you're not one of his people, you can't expect to be led. You can't expect to be guarded or protected. You can't expect to receive God's promises ultimately uh, in entering the promised land or what God has for his people. Again, this is what he's doing for his people. And so for those of us who are Christians, these three truths right here, when Yahweh is coming, is one of the greatest promises that we have ever been given, because our God is coming to deliver us. He's coming to save us. He's coming to rescue us. This is a comforting truth for us, but for those of you who aren't yet Christians, this is a nightmare, just like the people in Jericho. This is what they feared the most. Yahweh was coming. This is what they feared the most. It was a nightmare for them because someday, very soon, all of us in this room and everyone in this world will stand before this God, this one God. No one else, not going to stand before Mary, not going to stand before some Egyptian God, Isis or or Zeus or whatever. You're going to stand before this God and we're all going to give an account. Every knee will bow and every tongue in this room will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is the guarantee of Scripture. Yahweh is coming, and that is why these people were absolutely terrified, because it wasn't that this group of slaves was coming. They couldn't, they couldn't challenge them. They couldn't drive them out of the land. Again, it was an impossible situation. This was something that only God could do, and they knew that there was a God who was coming after them. And so the people, they were going to have to respond in one of two ways, and what we see in this passage. We have a response of faith. Rahab actually responded, you know what? I know Yahweh is coming. And so I'm going to trust in Yahweh. I'm going to give my life to Yahweh. I'm going to identify myself now as God's people. I'm going to turn away from the world. But then we have the opposite response, and that is the response of rejection. And so we see two responses from the people of Jericho here. But for us who are believers, again, this is a comforting truth, the fact that Yahweh is coming. Because when he does, as he does, believers, we will be saved and protected but unbelievers, those who have, have not believed this message, those of you who, who aren't yet Christians, who don't trust in Christ, in your rejection of him, he will reject you. You will be rejected and unprotected. And so remember this because it's one of the most important things that you and I will ever remember, this fact right here. Yahweh is coming. He was, he was coming in the Old Testament to conquer Canaan. He came 2,000 years ago to conquer Satan, sin, and death. He fulfilled all of, every time he came, he always fulfilled everything that he said he was going to do. And he's coming one more time to, to place all things under his feet. To put all things and all people in subjection under him. That is what he is coming to do one final time. And so for all of us here today, we need to be his people. And if we are not his people, if there's anyone here who's not a Christian yet, then you need to become his people. You need to be like Rahab and repent of your sins. So let me pray for us real fast, and then we will jump into Joshua 2. Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you so much for who you are. God, we thank you that you are God, and there is no other. We, God, there is no other God who can satisfy. There is no other God who can protect. There is no other God who can do what you can do. God, you have no rival, and you have no equal 
God, you are amazing. And we don't deserve your grace. We don't, I mean, it's, that's why it's called grace. It's undeserved kindness. But God, that you pour it out upon We don't deserve a way of salvation. We, we just deserve judgment, like Rahab. She was a citizen of Jericho. She deserved to die in this judgment. And God, you provided a way to be saved. And Rahab took it. She believed that if she trusted in you, if she leaned on you, if she identified herself as one of your people, God, that you would save her. And that's exactly what you did. And so, Father, I pray if there's anyone in this room that is not yet a Christian, God, that you would be working on their heart, working on their mind. Father, that you would lead them to this point where they receive Christ. Where they, they, they recognize that even in our day, Yahweh is coming. And there will be a day when it will be too late. And so, God, I pray that they won't wait for that day. But, Father, that they would repent, turn from their sins, and turn to Christ right now. I pray that you would guide us today as we are in Joshua chapter 2. That you would guide us through this passage. God, we love you so much and praise you in your name. Amen. Joshua 2, verse 1 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. And so the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Now, 40 years before this event, Moses had also sent out spies into the land, 12 of them to be exact. But there are some, some minor and major differences between the two events. First, um, in Numbers chapter 13 through 14, this is the passage where Moses sends out the spies. And in Joshua 2, this is our passage today. So these are the parallel accounts here. Moses sent out 12 men. Joshua only sent out two men. So there's a difference right there. Moses sent one from each tribe. So he sent out one from the tribe of Issachar, one from the tribe of Judah, one from Simeon, one from this tribe and that tribe. I'm going blank on the rest of the tribes. But anyway, you get the idea. One from each tribe. But the reason why this was such a grievous sin in the nation of Israel, the reason why they didn't inherit the land beforehand, was because Moses did not just choose a random guy from the tribes. He chose the overseer of the entire tribe. He chose the chief over Issachar. He chose the chief over Judah. He chose the chief over Ephraim. And 10 of these great leaders in the nation of Israel came back and said, we do not believe that God is faithful. We do not believe that God will fight our battles. We do not believe that God will actually fulfill his promises. And so the leadership of the nation of Israel was evil at that time. They did not trust God. And they ended up stirring the people up so much that they rejected God and his blessings. And so they missed out on all of God's promises. And so when Moses sent out one leader, the chief over each tribe, this was a public event. All of Israel knew exactly what was going on. But Joshua did this secretly. I don't know if he learned from this or whatever, but he chose to send only two men. Last time only two men came back with a good report. Ten came back with an evil report. And Joshua now did this in secret. Moses sent them to spy out a lot of the land, a vast portion of it. Uh, Joshua focused mainly on Jericho. Spy out a lot of the land, but really just we want you to focus on Jericho. Moses sent them out for 40 days. Joshua, these spies were only gone for three to four days. They really would have been back sooner, but they got sidetracked having been pursued by the pursuers from Jericho. And then the main difference here is this last point. When the men came back for Moses, they reported what they saw, and they failed to trust God. They failed to trust God. And, and so then we have the wilderness wandering for 40 years until the entire generation of men died, and we have the book of Deuteronomy. In Joshua's time, the men came back, they reported what they saw, and they had faith in God. That is the key distinction that's going on here. 
And so in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, the people rejected God, but in Joshua chapter 2, they had faith in God. And so what we see in verse 24, they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of this. This is their faith. This is their response to what God is doing here in Joshua chapter 2. And so the only real difference, again, that matters here is the fact that an entire generation of God's people, saved individuals, spiritually saved individuals, they missed out on God's blessings because they did not trust him. They did not believe that he would actually come through on his word. While this next generation, Joshua's generation, received God's blessing because they took him at his word and they believed his promises and ended up receiving their inheritance. What do we learn from this? We learn that even, this is key, even God's people can miss out on God's blessings. Even God's people can miss out on God's blessings. This is absolutely possible. If we do not trust God to lead us and take care of us, we will miss out on what God has for us. The book of James, we were just in it. James even had a whole statement where he said, you have not because you ask not. If we do not trust God as God's people, spiritually saved individuals going to heaven when we die, we can actually miss out on God's blessings. But, and this is key, only God's people will receive God's promised inheritance. Only God's people will go to heaven when they die. Only God's people will be saved when Jesus comes back. Only God's people will receive salvation. And so this is key. Even God's people can miss out on God's blessings in this life, but only God's people will receive God's promised inheritance. And so if you're not a child of God, if you're not a Christian yet, you will not receive, you may be blessed. Jesus even said it rains on the just and the unjust. Like God provides common grace to all people. The fact that you and I are here today, is a testament of his grace in our lives. He has given us this day as a gift. And so God has been good to each and every one of us. And so you are experiencing his grace right now, even as I speak, right now as we sit here. And so you might experience his blessings. Christians and non-Christians can do that. But only God's people, only those in the faith, will actually come into the promised land that God has for us. And so what we see in the first two chapters of Joshua is basically the same sequence of events. God came to Joshua, Joshua came to the people, and the people responded. Chapter 2, Joshua came to the spies, the spies came to the people, the people of Jericho, and the people responded. We have the exact same sequence of events going on here. The difference being that chapter 1 is referring to believers, talking about the faith community of Israel. God came to Joshua. Joshua then went to the people. How is Israel going to respond? How is God's people, how are they going to respond? Well, they responded here in faith. But now we have chapter 2. They didn't miss out on God's blessings, by the way. And now in chapter 2, we have, it's more directed to unbelievers. Joshua comes to the spies and sends them out. They go into the city of Jericho. And they're going out, they're, they're spying out the land, they're keeping their eyes open, head down a little bit, but keeping their eyes open, they're, they're getting a good perspective. And the people responded, and you have two different ways that an unbeliever can respond to God and to God's message. They can either respond in belief, like Rahab did, or they can respond in disbelief. And so again, the difference here is that chapter 1 is for believers, it's kind of directed that way. Chapter 2 is directed towards unbelievers, and so everyone in this room what we see here through our study so far, everyone in this room has a choice to make. Will you trust God for your life and everything that that entails, or will you not? That's a question that we all have to wrestle with, with every aspect of our lives, our families, our our money, our futures, and everything that that our life entails. Will we trust God, or will we not? The people of Israel had a choice to make. Are they going to trust God Or are they going to be like the former generation of Israel that rejected him? Chapter 2, are the people of Jericho going to trust God like Rahab did? Are they going to submit themselves like Nineveh did? Or are they going to reject him? And as a whole, the city received judgment because they did not trust him. And so what we see is that Rahab, though, was not the only one who was trusting God here. The spies also were entrusting and placing their very lives in the hands of Yahweh, believing in this truth. Yahweh is coming. 
And as he comes, when he comes, he will guide his people in the right direction. After all, this is what I want you to see, is that in this first section, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, God is nowhere to be seen. God is not named. His title is not there. He's not even implied. Nowhere to be seen in this first section. And yet, Yahweh is guiding his people in the right direction. The spies, they just so happen to enter this house for tonight's lodging. They just so happen to enter Rahab's house, and Rahab just so happens to be converting to faith in Yahweh at this moment. Everything just so happens to work out for the benefit and protection and provision of God's people. God is not seen in this passage. He's not directly stated, and yet he's overseen all of these events, every circumstance of the lives of these individuals. God is in charge of this. It's as if there is a sovereign God who is orchestrating and organizing all of life's circumstances for the advancement of his purpose and the blessing of his people. This is what God is doing. It's not mentioned directly, but he is overseeing everything that is going on here. And so Yahweh, what we see in scripture, he guided Abraham into unfamiliar territory. He guided Israel in their wilderness wandering. He guided these two spies perfectly in Joshua chapter 2 to the right place, the right time, to the right people. And he guided Ruth into Boaz's field. And if you haven't read the book of Ruth, I would encourage you to do so. But in Ruth chapter 2 verse 3, it actually even says that Ruth just so happened to be gleaning in the field that belonged to Boaz. She didn't know who Boaz was. She she wasn't even an Israelite. She was a Midianite she, or a Moabite, one of those ites. She came from another land, and she came here, and she just so happened. She went out because there was a law that said if you just work on the outer part of the field, even poor people can go, and they, they can glean from the field. And that's what Ruth was doing. And she just so happened to stumble upon this one man's field. And, it, and that's how the book goes. That's how their entire lives go. And it shows us that we are not writing our story. God is actually writing our story, every single detail, God is the one who is in charge. He is the one who's in control. He is the one overseeing all of these events. And so Yahweh, this truth is clear, Yahweh is guiding his people in the right direction. Whether we see it or not, whether we feel it or not, our God is always working. He's always guiding us. And so God is never mentioned, if you look in the book of Esther, God's never mentioned there, and yet his divine providence, protection, provision, even presence, fill up every page. The Bible is clear that by the time of Christ, the people of Israel actually knew this to be true, that God would guide them. John 4, 25, this is the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. This is a statement by a Samaritan, but she's an Israelite. And she recognizes that when the Messiah comes, he will give us the information that we need. He will guide us in the right direction. We need him to do that. That's what she was waiting on. Jesus himself said in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he actually uses his word, he will guide you into all the truth. This is the theme that we see throughout scripture. Yahweh is guiding his people in the right direction. But again, if you're not a Christian, you can't expect to be led by him. You might be led by demons or the world or yourself or sinful impulses or whatever else it might be or whoever else it might be, but you can't expect to be led by God. Again, a father leads his family, a pastor leads his church, government leads his nation. God is going to lead his people. And so if you're outside of that camp, if you're outside the camp of Israel, outside the church, not the building, outside the people of God though, if you are of your own people, the people of the world, you are outside of God's leading. And thus you are outside of God's protection and you will not be saved from the wrath to come. The judgment that is coming upon Jericho in this account and specifically the judgment that is coming upon the world. And so Yahweh is guiding his people in the right direction. And so again, even though he's not mentioned in this first section, none of it would have taken place without his guiding hand and his supernatural involvement. He will guide his people in the right direction. And so what do we see in Joshua 2, 1 through 7? Well, ultimately we see Joshua came to two spies and he sent them out. He sent two men out to go spy secretly the land. And when they came into Jericho, they were probably walking through the city. Again, head down a little bit. You know, you don't want to call attention to yourself. They weren't announcing their presence. But they went into Jericho and then they, they found a place to lodge. They went into Rahab's house. 
And when word reached the king, maybe they were, maybe it was when they were eating and drinking or whatever they were doing in Rahab's house or maybe just walking through the street. Somehow, in some way, there were people in Jericho who recognized these men. Not that they knew them, but they, they, they could tell those are Israelite men. And I know exactly what they're doing. Because again, Jericho knew why they were there. And so word then reached the king, there are two Israelite men who are in the city, they're spying out the land. And so then king, the king sent word to Rahab in order to basically bring these men to, to judgment. They wanted to get an upper hand on what God was doing there in the city. But Rahab lied about their whereabouts, actually sent them in the wrong direction. But what we see here ultimately is that these Israelite men, they just so happen to be in the right place at the right time with the right people. We see that when the enemies came knocking at the door, God protected them. And we see that God chooses to use some of the unlikeliest people in his plans. Now, Rahab was a prostitute, very clear on that. We see that throughout other parts of the scripture. But most likely, at least I hope, she was also an innkeeper, which is possible. You don't go into a foreign land and just kind of find a house and say, I'm going to bunk here tonight, yet... I guess you could Airbnb now, but they didn't have that back then. And so, I, you know, I, I'm kind of hopeful someday I'll, if you're a Christian, you'll be able to ask them exactly what they were doing. Because this is where I break down. You know, some people ask, like, big theological questions, like God's sovereignty, election, transubstantiation, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, all, all that, the big words. And I'm like, why did they stay at a prostitute's house? You know, I'm, I think I'm a pretty simple guy. I want to know what they were doing here because now it's recorded for all of us to know. So you always want to live a life accusation-free, but at the very least, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that possibly she was an innkeeper. There was a reason why they were lodging there more than the other thing, which we will not speak of. But anyway, basically what's going on here, God uses the unlikeliest people. He's using a prostitute here. And if this is true, that she had a lodge for them, then over the years, you can kind of see this playing out. Men, families, whoever, they, they would come in, and they would come out. And they would eat, and they would drink, and they would get a room, and then they would leave in the morning. And, and day after day, week after week, year after year, Rahab, as she's serving them with whatever it was, she would be overhearing this, this consistent theme that these people would be talking about. Did you hear what Yahweh did when he parted the Red Sea? Did you hear when the Egyptians, they, they all left the land of Canaan. They all went back to Egypt. Now everything's just kind of chaotic. You know, we're kind of all our own individual cities. We no longer have Egyptian protection, different things like that. They're, they're telling all about their fear of this one truth that Yahweh was coming. And Rahab's hearing this. Year after year after year, until this point now, when she has her one chance. She has two Israelite men who are coming out to spy out the land. This is her one chance to be saved. And so what she realized is that Yahweh is coming. He will guide his people in the right direction. And Rahab understood this. He will guard his people from the coming wrath. See, he was going to protect his people, Israel, obviously, but she wanted to be in, included in that. And so it says in verse 8, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and when you, what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. That's found in Numbers chapter 21, if you're interested. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. 
Then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your word, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Now, last week in chapter 1, we talked about how Joshua was so convinced that God was going to be faithful, he was going to fulfill his promises, and now we see Rahab's confidence in this section. Rahab's confidence in Yahweh, verse 8, I know, 100% certain of this fact alone, I know that the Lord has given you the land. This land does not belong to Jericho anymore. God is giving you this land. Verse 11, I know that the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She was now officially rejecting all of the former gods. She was rejecting all of Jericho's gods, all the pagan gods. She was now believing wholeheartedly in Yahweh. And this is what we see. Rahab the sinner, she heard about Yahweh over the years. As, as men would come in, travelers would stay at the lodge if, if she was an innkeeper. Uh, she believed in Yahweh and she submitted to Yahweh. She did these three things. And what she did here was that by helping the spies, she was no longer identifying herself as an idolater, but now as an Israelite. No longer identifying herself as a pagan of the world, but now as a person of the Lord. Rahab was officially casting her lot with Yahweh and his people. And this is where so many people in Western churches today get hung up, or at least get lost. They hear about Yahweh and everything that he's done. That Jesus died for my sins. He rose again for me. They, they hear that, and they even believe that, that, that fact. It's historical fact. It's not fiction. It actually happened. Jesus is a real person. He came 2,000 years ago. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for my sins. He took my place. He rose again for me. He ascended into heaven. He, the Spirit came. Church was born. Gospel has gone out all over the world. They hear that, and they even believe that. It's just cultural Christianity. You just kind of like, yeah, okay, I understand that. I believe that. I, I hold that as historical fact. That's where I was until I was 16 when the Lord actually saved me. What many Western Christians fail to do is this last section here, submit to Yahweh. They submit to Yahweh. Call him Lord, not just with your lips, but actually with your life. He is my master. I am his servant. He is the Lord of my life. The Bible even says that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you will be saved. This is what many people do not do. They do not submit to Yahweh. And this is what people are missing today, is the fact that they don't do this. They don't believe that Yahweh will truly satisfy me more than what the world can satisfy me. They don't actually want to hand over the freedom and the control of their lives to this God. And so that is why many people go to church week after week, but aren't really saved because they have never surrendered their life to Yahweh. And so Rahab, though, was different than this. Rahab actually heard the reports, she believed in Yahweh, and she submitted her life. She now acted out in faith. She realized that this may be the only opportunity, or even my last chance, to respond to God's calling upon my life. That is what Rahab realized. And so think about it this way, Yahweh was not just coming to bring judgment, he was coming to do that, but Yahweh was coming to bring salvation before the judgment. That is what Yahweh was doing. So this truth is simple. Yahweh, he will guide his people in the right direction, and he will guard his people from the coming wrath. Everyone in Jericho experienced God's wrath, God's judgment, except one family. And that was Rahab's family. Because they not only heard the news, they believed the report, and they also acted on that. They did not, it even says here, if, if anyone leaves that house, or goes into the street, their blood is on their own hands, because now they're officially taking their life in their own hands. 
But if anyone stays in the house, they will be saved. There was one way for everyone to be saved. He will guard his people from the coming wrath. That is God's promise throughout the scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, We wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. But if you don't know him, again, if you don't belong to him, then you can't expect to be led or protected by him. On the contrary, if you choose to reject him, you choose to do exactly what Jericho did. You choose to war against him and bring judgment on yourself. But take note of this. All of Jericho, like I said before, all of Jericho knew that Yahweh was coming. Verse 2, it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come tonight to search out the land. Again, they knew exactly what they were doing. They weren't oblivious to this fact. Verse 3, the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring the men out, for they have come to search out the land. Again, he knew exactly who these men were, what they were doing. Verse 9, Rahab says, The fear of you has fallen upon us all. Verse 10, For we have heard, we have heard this news, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings. Verse 11, As soon as we heard it, everyone has heard this news. Our hearts melted, didn't want to repent, didn't want to submit to Yahweh, but our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is the God of the heavens above and the earth beneath. These were innocent people that we're talking about. And this is why so many people are confused with the book of Joshua, because their only thought uh, is, how could a good God do this to so many innocent people? The answer to that question, though, what they fail to realize is that those people don't exist. There are no innocent people. And so what the answer, the, the long-time question, what happens to the tribal guy in the Amazon rainforest who's never heard the gospel? He goes to hell. It is as simple as that. It's an emotional question, and that is an emotional answer, but that is why the Great Commission is so necessary. We've got to get the gospel to all people all over the world. Because if they don't know about Jesus, they can't believe. And if they don't believe, they can't submit. They can't can't trust in Christ for salvation. They will experience God's judgment. Because there's no such thing, no matter what Disney wants to portray, the Native Americans were not innocent. They were absolutely wicked people. Every culture, every society is filled with one type of person, and it is an evil person. There's no such thing as an innocent person person. And so oftentimes we think, oh man, if people just knew the truth. Well, actually, Jericho knew the truth. They knew exactly what Yahweh was doing, and they rejected him. They resisted him, and so they brought on themselves judgment. The Pharisees in the New Testament, they knew exactly what Jesus was doing. They knew who Jesus was. They just didn't care. They were jealous of him, and so they rejected him. They led the entire nation astray. And so it is not true to say that if they just knew the truth, they would believe. Scientists all over the world know right now that evolution is baloney, and yet they still believe it, and they still teach it. It, The reason is because they hate Yahweh. That is the only reason they do that. Some of them are deceived, but some of them are deliberate in their and, and propagating false beliefs. And so this is why, again, so many people are confused with the book of Joshua, because they think innocent people exist, and it is not the case. We all deserve God's wrath. We all deserve judgment. We all deserve condemnation. But in spite of everything we deserve, our God is faithful to always provide a way of escape and salvation. Because out of all the homes, businesses, shelters, government buildings, and even the king's palace in Jericho, there was one place that you could go to be saved. But there was only one place that you could go to be saved. Back in Noah's day, it was the ark. You have to get in Noah's boat. It's the only way to be saved from global judgment. In Jericho, this entire city was going to be judged. The only way to be saved was to be in Rahab's house. It's this picture that God is painting throughout the course of human history is that there is a way to be saved, but there's only one way to be saved. There's not all these different avenues that you can take. There's one way. And so in Noah's day, it's the boat. In Rahab's day, it's the house. In our day, it's Christ. This is why you need to be in Christ. That's why you need to trust in him, because he is the only way to be saved. And so for us, again, it's Christ. It's this picture that God's been presenting all the way through, but the fact remains, Yahweh is coming. He will guide his people in the right direction. He will guard his people from the coming wrath, 
And number three, he will give his people everything that he's promised. And the reason for that, again, is because our God is a faithful God. He is faithful as always. And so it says in verse 22, they departed, they went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. And they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away before us. Now after the men, they climbed out the window. They handed her a scarlet cord and said, this is a sign of the covenant. You put this on your window. And when we see it, when we're surrounding the city, God's judgment is surrounding the city. God is actually going to protect you. Similar to how he passed over in uh, Egypt, all the firstborns that didn't have the blood on the doorpost. Every firstborn in Egypt died that night. But God didn't just pass over his people. The, the actual picture there is that he covered his people. He sheltered his people from all of the wrath that was taking place elsewhere, all throughout the city. That's what God's doing. God protects his people, his people. He doesn't protect other people. This is why you have to join his people so that you will be eternally protected from the judgment that is to come. And so they handed her the scarlet cord. This is the sign of the covenant, our covenant. We will not go against this covenant as long as you don't tell of our business. And so, again, that is, that is a picture of then us who are Christians, we have been sealed with God's Holy Spirit. It is the guarantee of our promised inheritance and what God is going to, to do for us. And so they took Rahab's advice, then they went into the hills, they hid from the pursuers a few days until they stopped looking, and then they went to Joshua and told him everything that happened. And I know in verse 22, again, the context, this is a real event, they were hiding from the pursuers. They pr waited a few days, and then the pursuers stopped looking. They then went to Joshua, told them everything that was happening. I understand that. But in verse 22, there is a spiritual truth here right at the end. These pursuers, they searched all on the way, and they found nothing. And the spiritual truth here is this. If you are an enemy of God, if you choose to reject him, then in the end, you will ultimately come up empty-handed and lose everything. Exactly what we see all throughout scripture, is that if you reject God time and time again, if you continue attempting to, to live life apart from Yahweh and his promises, that is foolishness. You come up empty-handed, and like Jericho, you'll lose everything. Everything you always tried to hold on to, everything you, 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 you just tried to collect in your life, you will lose it. Even if you gain the whole world, you lose your soul. And so the pursuers, they came up empty-handed before too long again, Jericho would lose everything in the judgment. And so in the end, only God's people actually receive God's promises. In chapter 1, Joshua's faith inspired the people. From a leader, he passed on his faith to others. We see at the end of chapter 1 that Israel's faith, Israel's faith the, the faith community, they inspired one another. They were encouraging one another. And then in chapter 2, Rahab's faith inspired the people. Here's an outsider, a prostitute, former sinner. I mean, someone who's on the outside coming in, being part of the faith community, and her faith inspires the people. So much so that they say this, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Now, there's a lot you could probably take out of this word right here. It's truly. So the fact is that before this event, it only heard from within God's people, from within the nation of Israel, about what God was going to do. But now they're hearing this, they're seeing this, firsthand from Rahab who's actually converting to the faith but even from people who are who are still going to reject and 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 receive God's judgment they saw this they heard this firsthand and now they are they are even more convinced of this fact truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands truly he is as faithful as he always is and so this is this is one of the reasons why right here Rahab's faith right here this is one of the reasons why we encourage gathering together as a church, gathering together in small groups. This is one of the reasons why if you get saved, get baptized. It's a public event. It's a, it's, 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 it is a first step of obedience, but I like to look at it as a public, the first step of a public profession. I'm telling the whole world, yeah, but I'm, I'm telling all of my friends, all of my faith family, this is a, a anything that we can do publicly, meet together, praise God together, 
I'm excited about us being able to, to hopefully in the next few weeks announce and then us vote on and, and pray over publicly our deacons uh, who are about to join the team. Like anything that we can do publicly right here is like Rahab's faith. It inspires the people to do this, to say stuff like this. Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. We become the people of God who become even more convinced of what we believe. The world does this. Very easy example is globalization, Facebook, all the crazy people all over the world. They can find each other now, and they can collect, and they can build upon that and all of their ideologies, and the world goes to chaos, and we can see that all around us. Well, let's use Satan's tactics against him. You know, let's leverage that opportunity. We can do the exact same thing. We can grow more convinced of the faithfulness of our Lord by encouraging one another from the leadership down, from within the body, and even from those on the outside who come in, who receive Christ, are saved from their sins, who, who, who are saved from the wrath to come, and who join the people of God at this point. And so if you do not know God, this, this is my encouragement, my challenge for you, that this is, this is your moment to make that decision forever and ever. Uh, what Israel was growing in was this fact, God is fighting your battles, fulfilling his promises, faithful as always. This is what we as a church, as Christians, this is what we're growing in. Our confidence in this God, Yahweh alone. But what Jericho was about to find out, and what all the world is about to find out, is that Yahweh is coming one more time to put all things and all people in subjection under him, all under his authority. He will guide his people in the right direction. He will guard his people from the coming wrath. He will give his people everything that he's promised. The point here for believers is that God will guarantee his people win in the end. But for unbelievers, you don't get any of this. You're not guided, you're not guarded, you're not given anything. Instead, you miss out completely. And so for us as Christians, the challenge is is to grow in our confidence in our Lord. Yahweh is faithful. He will fight our battles. He will fulfill his promises. That is our God whom we serve. But for everyone in this room who's, who's not yet taken that step, I say yet because I believe that you should right now. And I actually want to lead you in a prayer. If that is you, if you haven't trusted in Christ, you're going to miss out. You're going to experience judgment. And so I want you, I want you to be saved. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Um, it's not the words. The words don't save you. But you, you have to genuinely mean this. I'm not only hearing the report that Jesus died for my sins, that he rose again. I'm not only believing that as historical fact, but I'm actually, I'm submitting my life to Yahweh. I'm joining the faith community. I am, I di- I am identifying myself, not as, not as an idolater any longer, but as a true Israelite, as a Christian in, in our terminology. And so I want to pray with you. If that is you, just pray with me now. Heavenly Father, God, I know that I am a sinner, I, and there is nothing that I can do to be saved. Judgment is coming, just like in Jericho. Judgment is coming regardless of what I do. Judgment is coming. I will be judged. Or, God, there is a place that I can go to be saved. And for me, God, you've given me that one promise that that place that I can go is Christ. God, I admit that I am a sinner. I I admit that I deserve judgment. I admit that I can't save myself. God, there's nothing that I can do. I believe that Jesus died for me personally. When he was on the cross, he thought of my name. He did that all for me. He didn't stay dead, though. He rose again. When I die, I will stay dead if I don't believe in Christ, but, but Jesus is offering me the keys to the grave. He's offering to unlock the door. He's offering to invite me right now into the, the community of faith in which I will have eternal life. And so, God, again, I admit that I don't deserve your grace. I'm a sinner apart from you. I believe in what Jesus has done for me, that he's died and rose again for me. And God, I I submit my life to you. I call you Lord for the first time, for the first time in my life. God, you are my Lord. You are my master. 
I do not want to be judged, but instead I want to be a new person. I want to receive the sign of the covenant. God, I want you to save me. And so, Father, please do the work that only you can do. Save me from my sin. Save me from the wrath to come. Protect me, guard me, seal me. I am yours, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that, I'd like to encourage you to tell somebody, again, just like Rahab, you know, it, it encourages faith, it builds up faith. Um, as the worship team comes up, you know, front's always open. Um, if you need to do business with God, otherwise, if you need to do business with God in another way, you know, find someone. Again, we, we should be a, a community of faith that we get together, we pray together, we love one another, we encourage one another publicly because that builds confidence.